Good morning. Good morning, brethren. Please take your seats for those of you who are still looking for seats. Blessed morning to all. Typhoons, Rolly and Ulysses that hit hard uh, some parts in the main island of Luzon remind me of one episode in the lives of Jesus and his disciples. This is one of the most well-known miracles in the Bible tells of when Jesus come the stormy sea of Galilee. And this is recorded actually in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And here in this story, we see Jesus was looking to cross the sea to expand his ministry to the Gentiles. The disciples knew it was his will to go to the other side, and Jesus expected them to believe in this mission. However, Soon after launch, Jesus laid down to sleep. And then, a violent storm started brewing. The waves were breaking over the edge of the boat, filling it with water. Now remember, many of the disciples were fishermen by trade, right? So they are very familiar with storms on the Sea of Galilee. However, as the story tells us, this was no ordinary storm super typhoon and they began to fear for their lives mark chapter 4 37 to 41 tells us and a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling but he jesus was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they woke him and said to him teacher do you not care that we are perishing and he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea peace be still Immediately, the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he turned to them, said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? They were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? You see, unlike his disciples, Jesus believed and knew exactly that they were going to make it to the other side safely. I mean, if Jesus was asleep, he must not have been worried, right? And so there should be no cause actually for the disciples also to be concerned either. After rebuking the storm, Jesus then rebuked his disciples, asking why they were so afraid, why they had wavered in their faith in him. The disciples were too astonished by what they had just seen to attempt to answer even the question or the rebuke of Jesus. But brethren, even today, 2,000 years later, many Christians still sometimes panic during the storms of life. Indeed, storms in our lives are bound to happen. Yes, some storms are so intense that even our deep and abiding faith may waver. Just like the disciples, being a follower of Jesus does not guarantee a storm-free life. But the words of Jesus or the rebuke of Jesus is very important. Listen and take heed. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Remember, Jesus is God. Jesus is our God, our Savior. He's not just extraordinary teacher. He's not just exemplary great leader. He is God himself became man. He is the only hope of mankind of, for our lives here and for eternity. He is the Lord of all creation. He controls not only the storms, He controls everything that even our eyes cannot perceive. Every little detail of things. He is the ruler of all. 
And just as we see in the story, although Jesus was asleep in the boat, he was very much in control of the situation. So brothers and sisters, even if there is a time where you do not feel God is in control while you are weathering your storm, God is asking you, why are you afraid? Have you no faith? God is looking for you to have faith in Him. Brethren, some of us are experiencing some kind of storms because of this pandemic. Some are stricken with certain illness, death of our beloved. What about financially? I'm aware that some of our members are hit greatly, even financially speaking. The income of our brethren who are really lessened in significant amount because of certain works and businesses are not doing well. But there is no reason to be afraid. There is no reason to be anxious because Jesus is in control and He is with us. He loves us more than we can even love one another. So let us trust the one who controls and rules over the storms. God permits storms to hit us so that the genuineness of our faith is tested. As James said, in, count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. And so here we are today, gathered to worship our great God, the sovereign one, the merciful one. Let's praise his name. He is our God most high. He will not forsake his people. He will not forsake those who are seeking his face. Let's learn from him. Listen to the word of God where God says, be still and know that I am God. Let's all rise. Let's express our faith. Let's express our thankfulness to the God of the universe, the God who calls us by his name to be his. We belong to him. Therefore, there's no reason to be afraid. Trust Him. Be confident in Him. Let's give Him all our praises and adorations with joy and thankfulness in our hearts.
be still and do not fear the wind so change may rage tomorrow God is at your side no longer dread the fires of unexpected sorrow God, you are my God And I will trust in you and not be shaken Lord, all peace renew A steadfast spirit within me To rest in you alone So be still, do not be moved by lesser lights so of fleeting shadows. Stole unto his way with shield of faith against temptation's flaming arrows. God, you are my God, and I will trust in you and not be shaken. Lord, of peace renew a steadfast spirit within me to rest in you alone. Forgiveness is my gaze 
I said, redeemed by grace alone. I will wait for you. I will wait for you on your word. I will rely. I will wait for you. Surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied. is my light and my salvation whom shall i fear the lord is the stronghold of my life of whom shall i be afraid yes my soul find rest in god my hope comes from him truly he is my rock and my salvation he is my fortress i will not be shaken my salvation and my honor depend on god he is my mighty rock my refuge trust in him at all times you people Pour out your hearts to Him, for God is our refuge. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With Him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. 
with eternal pleasures at your right hand. We will hold on to your word. We will rely on your word. We will delight in your love. In Christ we pray. Amen. A blessed day to you all. What a privilege it is to worship the Lord and be gathered with the brethren of like mind and faith. Given the limitations issued by the IATF for public gatherings due to the pandemic, we try to make the most of our time together. Aside from worshiping, in song, praying, and studying God's Word, we have been allowing time to fellowship. As I have been emphasizing this past week's scripture underscores the importance of fellowshipping among God's people. A good example of this situation is reported at the end of the Old Testament. In the book of Malachi, we get a glimpse into the heart of God and His value for spiritual fellowship among believers. Malachi chapter 3 verses 13 to 15, we are told about the Lord's reproof of the stiff-necked Israelites. He said to them, your words have been arrogant against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God and what profit is it that we have kept his charge and that we have walked in the morning before the Lord of hosts. So now we call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, but they also test God and escape. The setting depicted here is the nation of Israel being in the process of restoration to its land by the Persian king. But the Israelites once again fell into corrupt religious formality rather than worshiping the true God. Nor they also did not obey God. In fact, many people in Israel were arrogantly saying that it was futile to serve God. Yet in the midst of that spiritual declension, there was a group of people who feared God and fellowship together. We are told in verse 16 of Malachi 3, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. And the Lord gave attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who esteem his name. Two things are apparent from this passage concerning fellowship. First, Take note that the godly Jews during Malachi's time considered fellowship important. We are told that the godly Jews or those who feared God spoke to one another. Meaning, these people understood the vital importance of encouraging one another when the entire nation was backsliding. So here is koinonia in action. They were not only concerned about their personal relationship with God, but also made sure that their fellow countrymen who genuinely feared God were encouraged to remain faithful to the Lord. Now, second, just as important is the clear indication of God's delight in their fellowship. Notice God listened in on their times of fellowship. And he took special note of it and even had a book of remembrance written in his presence concerning these godly people who sought to encourage one another and build each other up in the fear of the Lord. Obviously, the infinite, eternal mind of God does not need a book of remembrance to remind him of the gracious acts of his people. 
the allusion to such book is for our benefit. You see, God wants us to see the importance He places on fellowship among His people and the delight it brings His heart. So let us take time now to exercise spiritual fellowship, knowing that God may use us to encourage one another, cognizant of the truth that God is listening in, and fully aware too that this exercise delights God. I will give 15 to 20 minutes to fellowship with the brethren. Those of you occupying seats set up in those extension rooms outside this auditorium may fellowship with the folks there. But please keep your face masks and face shields on and maintain social distancing. I think there are some biscuits and instant coffee in the hallway. Joy shall fill my heart 
and I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God a great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to live How great thou art. And that is what we see in your word regarding our great God and Savior. We ask, dear Lord, that you might help us see your greatness once again in your word. And whatever things might be in our hearts this morning, whatever things may hinder the effective teaching of your word, we pray, dear God, that our hearts might be given grace so that we can apprehend your word truly. We trust, dear God, that whatever is may be heavy in our hearts and minds right now, you may give us the ability to be able to set them aside and to just focus on your word, that we might see your greatness once again. We give you praise and thanks for our time. In Jesus' name. May you all take your seats. In the 1970s, and I know many of you were born there, though you would not like to, at that time, you will probably not admit it. I remember watching on television the late Afro-American comedian, Flip Wilson. He entertained many at the height of his career. From 1970 to 1974, Wilson hosted his weekly variety series. In that show, he created and played the character Geraldine Jones. Yes, he dressed up as a woman. This character was Wilson's take on a modern black woman's woman from the South. As it turned out, Geraldine, the character Flip Wilson was playing, was something of a catchphrase machine with lines like, what you see is what you get. When you're hot, you're hot. And when you're not, you're not. And some others, many of which entered the cultural vocabulary of that day. But without a doubt, Geraldine's most popular catchphrase was, The devil made me do it. Every time the character Geraldine was accused by her husband of wrongdoing, whether it was buying a dress that was too expensive, or crashing the car into the side of the church. Her excuse was always the same. It wasn't me. The devil made me do it. Whether or not people watched Flip Wilson's character, Geraldine, in that show, many people grew up hearing these words. And eventually, it affected the way they see the devil. In fact, many people believe that the devil has the power to make us 
do things. Or they imagine him as a, as a little guy wearing a red suit with a pitchfork, sitting on our left shoulder, whispering into our ear. Meanwhile, there's a little angel perched on the right shoulder, trying to counteract whatever temptation the devil is whispering to us. And in the cartoons, the devil usually wins. Is this how temptation works? Is the devil really equally as powerful as God? Can the devil make us do anything we don't want to do? Well, the short answer is no. The truth is the devil does not have any power over us that we don't let him have. But he can be persuasive. Thankfully, the Lord understood his children's dilemma. For this reason, he teaches us to pray about this in the prayer the Lord taught his disciples in Matthew 6 verses 9 to 13. Again, the prayer goes, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our study of this prayer has allowed us to cover five of the six petitions taught by the Lord here. And last Sunday, we considered the first half of the final petition. And do not lead us into temptation. Now you will recall in our last lesson, we noted that with the word end, this indicates that there is a vital connection between the, this petition and the previous one. To be sure, we need forgiveness of all past sins, but we also and finally need assistance in overcoming any and all future sins. In fact, as we explained, it cannot be rightly said that we sincerely desire for God to forgive us our sins unless we truly long for grace to keep us from committing those same sins in the future. Hence, the truly penitent believer needs to pray and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So we could say that the fifth petition, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, is a petition for the pardoning of our sins. While the sixth petition, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, asks for deliverance from sin's power. Now, we also underscored last week that this sixth petition does not infer that God tempts anyone to sin. This is totally not the character of God. Evil cannot proceed from God because He is holy and everything that proceeds from Him is good and perfect. James 1 verse 17 tells us, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. And with respect to the source of temptation, the Apostle James even emphasized in verse 13 of chapter 1 of his epistle, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. This means that God does not inject in anyone evil, it does not inject evil in anyone so as to cost him or her to fall. Neither is he in any way a partner with us in our guilt and sin. As we have seen, the Greek word translated temptation helps us understand the Lord's meaning in this petition. The noun form of the word is perasmos, which is a neutral word, meaning it does not refer to anything good or bad. 
This is contrary to our modern minds because the word temptation to us is associated with things that are bad or evil. The verb form of perasmus is perazin, which means to try the strength of or to put to the test. So when the Lord taught us to pray and do not lead us into temptation, He was referring not to seducing man to sin, but to testing his strength, his loyalty, and his ability to serve God. And scripture is teeming with examples of men whom God tested objectively. That is, he brought circumstances in their lives, in the lives of people, which are not sinful in and of themselves, but may offer occasions for sin. When Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of property, we learn in Acts chapter 5, verse 2, that Ananias kept back some of the price for himself. Now, this was not sin in and of itself. To sell a piece of property and then keep back the proceeds for yourself was not sin at all. However, the couple might have promised and announced publicly that they were going to give the full amount of the sale of the property to the Lord. The sin Ananias and Sapphira was not of Ananias and Sapphira was not just lying about their spiritual hypocrisy uh, was not just lying but also because of their spiritual hypocrisy. And as we know in the story, they paid for their sins dearly. Examples abound in scripture where God tested individuals permissively. That is, God did not restrain Satan and allowed him to sift them like wheat. God, you see, may allow the devil to bring certain trials, but Satan does not, uh, but it is Satan who does the tempting, not God. So God brings struggles into our lives to test us, to exercise our spiritual muscle to strengthen us and to mature us. But in the midst of the test, if we do not perceive it through the eyes of God, commit it to Him, and stand in His strength, Satan will turn it into a temptation. So the implication of the petition is something like this. It, in effect, you're praying, Lord, Please do not lead us into a trial which will present such a temptation that we will not be able to resist. To be sure, God is never going to incite us or seduce us into sin. But He will bring things into our lives that become tests for us to show our spiritual strength and cause us to grow. However, if we fail the test, it turns into temptation that incites our lust and draws us into sin. Indeed, some testing is inevitable. So we do not shun every test. Yet we sense that there are some tests that we cannot pass. And if we do not escape them, they will entrap us. Thus, we ask the Lord to lead us away from the temptations that will defeat us. We pray that our Father will so arrange our life that we can remain loyal to Him. We do not look for a trouble-free life. But, even as the Lord's disciples, we understand that we face tests that are common to mankind. But we do ask God to spare us from tests we cannot endure. The good news is, we can pray to God for help. And we have the assurance written by Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with temptation 
will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. You see, friends, God desires to preserve His people. And this brings us to the second half of the prayer. But deliver us from evil. The word deliver is a very aggressive word in the original language. It can also be translated to snatch. And, you know, when you snatch something, you don't do it slowly. It's very aggressive. So, we are asking God to snatch us from the clutches of evil. As with praying for our daily bread, God's usual way of providing is not by miraculous means. I mean, when we pray for our daily bread, God, of course, may choose to provide food by ravens, like he did with the prophet, or to multiply bread. God can certainly do anything. But we all know that this is not the normal way God chooses to provide bread. God provides opportunities and strength to work. And through working and earning a wage, we provide bread for ourselves. It is the same with being delivered from evil. Sometimes it may be miraculous, but most times God works through prudence and diligence as we take advantage of His means of grace. Therefore, there is reason to pray, deliver us from evil. Now, there are some Bible teachers who restrict the word evil in this petition to the devil alone. In Greek, the word translated evil may actually be translated the evil one or the evil thing. Although I believe the devil is the one principally referred to here in this petition, I however think this petition expresses a desire to be delivered from all that is damaging or hurtful to us, and especially from sin which has no good in it. We of course understand that in contrast to God, who is the Holy One, Satan is designated the evil one as we read in verse 16 of uh, Ephesians 6. But we cannot downplay the fact that sin is evil. The world is evil too, as Galatians 1 verse 4 says. And our own corrupt nature is evil, Matthew 12 verse 35. Moreover, the advantages the devil gains over us are by means of the flesh and the world. These are the devil's instruments. For this reason, I believe that this is a prayer for deliverance from all spiritual enemies. But again, the devil is the primary object of this part of the petition. Now, Scripture, of course, has taught that believers have been delivered or rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. Colossians 1 verse 13. So we have been delivered. In other words, salvation in Christ Jesus brings true deliverance and protection from Satan. In Romans 8 37, Paul says, we overwhel overwhelmingly conquer because of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57, Paul also said that God always leads us in triumph. In 1 John 2, verse 13, John says, we have overcome the evil one. And in 1 John 4, verse 4, John says that the indwelling Holy Spirit is greater than Satan. So as a consequence, Satan no longer has any lawful authority over us. He cannot indwell Christians as some evangelists or teachers assert. If you are a believer, you cannot be possessed, all right? Nevertheless, our adversary wields an awesome and oppressive power. Though he cannot rule believers, 
he is permitted to molest and harass us. Let us look into a few examples of the devices Satan uses to harass and ensnare us. One of Satan's favorite devices is to make us believe that we are self-sufficient and therefore urges us to trust in our own resources rather than God. In the Old Testament, the enemy used the scheme against David. Do you remember that? We read in 1 Chronicles 21, verses 1 to 2, notice it says, Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the princes of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba, even to Dan, and bring me word that I may know their number. So clearly, that was not simply an idea that came from David. Scripture says, Satan stood against Israel and he moved David to number Israel. David wanted to find out how strong he was. So he had the military advisor count the available soldiers. But God told him that that was a terrible sin because his strength did not depend on the number of his troops but on God. In Psalm 147 verses 10 to 11, the psalmist said, The Lord does not delight in the strength of the horse. He does not take pleasure in the legs of man. The Lord favors those who fear him, those who wait for his loving kindness. Thus, David's falling into sins, uh, into Satan's trap, had serious consequences. For God sent judgment and 70,000 people in Israel died. It is easy for us to place our confidence in the wrong things, like even our mastery of scripture or even our consistent prayer life. But the Lord said in Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him, boast, let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things. We must seek to be delivered from putting confidence in our flesh. Another device the devil uses is to incite us to a prolonged self-indulgence with some particular sin that we are inclined. Understand this. No sin happens in a vacuum. Particularly those sins that people indulge in for a long period of time. Typically, a sin just does not happen all of a sudden. Sins are normally secretly nurtured or indulge in for a period of time. But one day, this sin will bear its ugly fruit. And if not checked, that sin might spread even to the entire church. Paul was incensed when he heard about the incestuous Corinthians. You remember that, of course. Thus, he wrote in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such kind as does not exist among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. The term father's wife probably indicates that the woman was the, mo the, the man's stepmother, not his mother. In either case, however, it was an incestuous relationship in God's eyes, which God did not allow. Leviticus 18, verses 7 to 8, explains this. Incredibly, the Corinthian believers 
instead of mourning over this obviously immoral situation, were actually proud of it. Thus, Paul rebuked them. In 1 Corinthians 5 verse 2, You have become arrogant and have not mourned. Instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. And as a consequence, Paul responded with this admonition. In verse 5, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What does the delivering the offender to Satan mean? Well, it means putting the guilty one out of the church. Thus, stripping him of the protection of the fellowship. We read in verse 2 that Paul says the offender was to be removed from their midst. He was to be, in other words, cut off from the community of God's children and the Lord's table. And Paul underscored here the importance of church discipline by using an analogy. In verses 6 to 8 of 1 Corinthians 5, he said, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Let, there, let us therefore celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Leaven represents sin, and the dough represents the whole church. If given the opportunity... Sin will permeate a whole church just as leaven permeates a whole loaf of bread. By its very nature, sin ferments, corrupts, and spreads. But Jesus Christ, God's perfect Passover lamb, separates us from the dominion of sin. Therefore, we are to remove everything from the old life that would permeate the new. We are to eat the bread of honesty, integrity, and truth, not wickedness. The Lord Jesus made it clear that when a person claims to be a Christian but continues in grave public sin and tramples on God's word, and ignores what the church has to say, he or she is to be put out of fellowship and regarded as an unbeliever. That's what Matthew 18 verses 15 to 17 teaches. And this places the sinning person under Satan's full control. And that is why we need to understand that sin does not just happen. It was nurtured. Sin never happens in a vacuum. Now we are told in 1 John 5.19 that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. In other words, the world is already in Satan's hands because of sin. But since the church is the object of God's care, love, and blessing, it is insulated and protected. Church discipline, on the other hand, removes sinning members from that protection, leaving them exposed to Satan. So prolonged indulgence in sin can go very far in terms of its effect on a person. It may even permeate a church. It may even bring sinning individuals outside the fellowship of the church. It is difficult to do this as a local church, to discipline and even excommunicate a member. But if we are to protect the holiness of God's body, this is something that we have to do, though painfully. But I encourage you all, I urge you all, in fact, do not play around with sin. 
if God is uh, if God is the Lord of the church, He will, and He certainly is, He will protect the church. In other words, if you are, you claim to be a believer, if you have gone through the process and have become a member, if you have pronounced that you are in Christ Jesus, I guarantee you, God will protect the church even if you are you know, sinning, uh, hid, you have, you're keeping secret sins and continually to do that outside the church. God will protect the church and He will expose that sin. In all my years in ministry, I have seen that happen. Lusot, kahit pastor nga, lusot na lusot na Kahit elders, lusot na lusot na Nobody knew. But, one chance meeting with a member of the church, everything was open like a floodgate. So, yeah, people can keep their sins. They can live double lives and become members of the church, become even active, be serving the church. But I guarantee you, God will protect His church. And if you are doing that, you will be exposed. Sana hindi na umabot doon. Sana hindi na umabot to the point of uh, having to be put out of the church. But that's what sin does. It does not happen in a vacuum. So, if there's something going on, ngayon pa lamang, you better deal with that sin. Okay? And if brethren have been excommunicated, I also guarantee you, in all my years of ministry, those who suddenly realize, what am I doing? And came back to church, they have been restored by God in a most glorious way. It is certainly... Uh, one of Satan's favorite devices, prolonged indulgence, so we must pray to be delivered from it. A third effective device Satan uses is instilling doubt. Satan tries to undermine God's character and credibility because he wants you to doubt God. Remember with, the, with that ploy, he succeeded in plunging the entire human race into sin. In the Garden of Eden, the crafty serpent questioned God's word, saying to Eve, in Genesis 3 verse 1, Indeed, has God said? He then called to question God's motives by saying that God has a selfish, ulterior motive in forbidding Adam and Eve to, to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 3 verse 5. He was saying that Adam and Eve could not trust God because he might say one thing but mean another. You see, Satan claims to be giving us the plain truth. But in reality, it is Satan who is the liar. The Lord Jesus said in John 8.44 that there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, meaning the devil, whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan wants you to doubt God, to doubt his word and his power. And we fall into the trap too often. We're tempted to worry and lose control in our difficult situation because we really don't believe God can solve our problem. Sometimes we doubt God's grace mercy and forgiveness and therefore become burdened by feelings of anxiety and guilt. Some people even wonder if God really loves them, especially when bad things happen, such as losing a job or even the death of a loved one. Brethren, we are responsible to resist doubt as well as any other temptation. We must therefore pray to be delivered from the evil of doubting God. Another device that Satan uses is to lead believers into false teaching. In all the years that I've had in ministry, I have met 
and spoken to many Christians who unfortunately understand very little of what the Bible says. They are so confused that they do not know what to believe. I am convinced that confusion is partly a ploy of Satan to frustrate Christians. He does so by using teachers to present a plethora of contradictory doctrines and interpretations that leave many baffled. But if we desire to stand firm and deliver and to be delivered from evil, we need to realize the proper use of the spiritual armor provided by God, as we are told about in Ephesians 6, verses 11 to 18. And part of the provision of our spiritual armor is the sword of the Spirit, in verse 17, which is the Word of God. We cannot overstate the importance of adhering to correct doctrine, which, of course, which is of course drawn from God's holy word. The soundness of our doctrine will help us combat the wiles of our spiritual enemy. And this holds true no matter what global crisis we may be facing. In Ephesians 6, Paul described the Word of God as the sword of the Spirit. That can be translated spiritual. You know, the sword is spiritual in the sense that the weapons of our warfare are not man-made. That's what Paul explained in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4. And fighting spiritual wickedness calls for spiritual weapons. Actually, all the pieces of armor, the belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the shield, and the helmet are all spiritual. And we need these parts of our armor to be so. Now, the phrase sword of the Spirit can also refer to a sword that is given by the Holy Spirit. And that speaks of where the sword comes from. Now, putting the two thoughts together gives the idea that our sword is spiritual because it was given by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. That makes the word a unique weapon, for it was not forged on human anvils or tempered by earthly fires. Without a doubt, any earthly sword pales in light of the invincibility of God's word in the hand of a knowledgeable earthly saint. So at risk of being redundant, we cannot overstate the importance of sound doctrine based on God's word, the sword of the spirit. We need to develop a love for sound doctrine because among other things, it keeps us from false doctrines. Bear in mind that scripture points to three sources of doctrine. One source is from devils. For this reason, Paul warns in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Be careful of what you listen to. Another source for doctrine is men. In Matthew 5 verse 19, the Lord Jesus derided the religious leaders for their hypocrisy and said, but in vain do they worship me, teaching us doctrines, the precepts of men. And the third source is God himself. Hence, Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Sound doctrine flows from God himself and, both, and is both uncorrupted and life-giving. Sound doctrine is an anchor of truth which steadies us from being 
tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, as Paul describes in Ephesians 4, verse 14. A love of doctrine will be a shield of truth against lies and doctrines of the enemy, which are rampant today, even in many churches and many Christian circles. When you're driving your car and listening to a radio station, you'll get the clearest signal when you're closest to the station's tower, right? It is easy to hear the station's music or broadcast because you are near to the source. But if you're driving out of town and going away from the tower, the radio signal gets weaker and starts breaking up. And when you stop hearing that station, you will start picking up radio signals from other stations. That's what happens in the spiritual realm. When we are spiritually close to God, we are able to clearly hear Him. But if we start drifting away, or we're deliberately running away from God, the signal gets weaker and it becomes hard to hear His voice. It's at that point that we become susceptible to hearing voices that are contrary to God. Voices that are dangerous doctrines of men and devils. Thus Paul warns in 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 to 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. This is a warning that we should embrace today because there are many churches who are exactly doing that. Seeker-friendly churches who cater to the desires of people who just want their ears, ears to be tickled. People who cannot endure sound doctrine. Are you far from God? If you want to hear His voice again, turn the car around and start heading in His direction. So let us develop a love for sound doctrine. And hear only His voice. The Lord Jesus reminds us, John 10 verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Another effective device that Satan employs is persecution. Satan uses not only doubt, but also difficulties. He wants to make things hard, not easy for the Christian. And often he uses persecution, persecution as a chief weapon. Multitude of believers throughout church history were tortured and killed for their faith. Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley were burned at the stake for teaching justification by faith alone. And when they were tied together at the stake, Latimer said, Be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust never shall be put out. He was right. We also learn of Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, who was taken into the stadium in his late 80s and told by the proconsul, renounce Jesus and the atheists and your life will be spared. You see, the emperor considered Christians to be atheists because they did not believe in the deity of the emperor himself. Well, Polycarp answered, 80 and 6 years has Christ been faithful to me and I would betray him now? Polycarp then looked to the stands of the stadium and to the box that held the proconsul and say, and said, Away with you, 
uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, away with the atheists. He was martyred a few moments later. I often wonder what I would do if I faced a similar test. Have you ever thought about that? If for some reason you were, you know, you were identified as a Christian and you were brought to the stake, you know, not to the firing squad, not to lethal injection, which are, which I think is more, which is less uh, problematic for us, less painful, but burned at the stake. Did you ever wonder what you would do? What would you say? Would you recant? If you ask me, frankly, I do not know. And I do not want to have to find out. So when we pray for the Lord's Prayer, we may ask that we may not be placed in a similar situation as those who were martyred. That's my prayer. Lord, wag na lang. Kung pwede, siya na lang. <laughs> not me. Honestly, I don't think any of us can boast and say, Ay, kaya ang kaya yan. The petition, deliver us from evil, is for divine protection from the forces of evil that surrounds us. And we should be praying it not only for ourselves, but also for each other. So that if the test comes, we will all stand. Now when we pray, deliver us from evil, how far will God deliver us from evil? What does this mean when God answers this petition? Well, first, God keeps us from evil so far as it would be hurtful to what is good for us. We already know that God will not shield us from all tests. But He will also make sure that we will not go so far as, that, uh, we will not go so far as to allow us to be hurt beyond what is necessary or beyond what is good for us. So the test will only be for what is good to you as the Lord determines it. The Apostle Peter's case is, an, is a good example. In Luke 22, verses 31 to 32, the Lord said to his disciples, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Satan wanted Peter because he was crucial to the early church's development. When Peter heard that Satan was after him, he responded in Luke 22, verse 33, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. But later that same evening, Peter denied the Lord Jesus three times. Afterwards, he went outside and wept bitterly as we read in verse 62. This was actually evidence of his repentance and restoration to God. What did Peter learn as a result of Satan's sifting? Well, he learned that he could not stand on his own. It also made him a more useful vessel for God because Christ told him to strengthen others after his repentance, as we read in Luke 22, verse 32. As a result of this experience, Peter learned the value of the refining process. We know this because years later, he wrote this to persecuted believers. 1 Peter 1, verses 6 to 7 in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the Lord used Satan's afflicting hand to harass Peter for the, the spiritual benefit of Peter. And for Peter, the real issue was not the activity of Satan, but the accomplishment of God's purposes. 
It was for Peter's ultimate good and the good of God's people that he suffered to fall temporarily. Therefore, when we pray, deliver us from evil, let us petition God for divine illumination so that we may be able to detect Satan's devices. Let us not be like Peter and foolishly put confidence in our flesh, knowing that Scripture tells us that our spiritual enemy can disguise himself even as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14. The devil is far too subtle for human wisdom to cope with. And only as the Holy Spirit graciously enlightens us can we discern his snares. How far will God deliver us? Well, second, God prevents evil from gaining full dominion over us so that we shall not apostatize. We are told in Hebrews 11 verses 33 to 34 that many Old Testament heroes who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths, the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword from weakness, were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. So these were strengthened. These saints were strengthened and they performed mighty acts of faith. But that was not true for everyone. For the passage continues in verses 35 to 38 of Hebrews 11. Others were tortured, not accepting their release in order that they may obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death with a sword. They went about in sheepskin, in goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. Men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. If these people had recanted their faith, they would have been set free. But they endured suffering because they were looking for a heavenly and eternal deliverance, not an earthly and temporal one. In other words, they were not hoping to be spared from death. It was worse to recant as far as these people were concerned. What were they looking for? A heavenly deliverance. They did not fear death. For they knew the final resurrection would clothe their bodies in immortality. And that is why the writer, well, some scribe wrote, men of whom the world was not worthy. The petition, but deliver us from evil, therefore reminds us to pray for strength to resist Satan's attack. For he is much too powerful to withstand in our might. Only as we are energized by the Spirit shall we be kept from willfully yielding to temptation or from taking pleasure in the sins we commit. Pray too for the grace to mortify or to put to death our lusts. For only to the degree that we put to death our own internal corruptions shall we be able to refuse the external temptations to sin. Friends, we cannot just throw blame on Satan while we give license to the evil of our own hearts. Remember, salvation from the love of sin always precedes deliverance from, uh, deliverance from its dominion. And when we do succumb to sin, let us seek God for genuine repentance. You see, sin has a fatal tendency to deaden our sensibilities and to harden our hearts. Nothing but divine grace can free us from indifference to sin and work in us a godly sorrow. In fact, the very words deliver us implies that we are deeply plunged into sin. It's like a beast that is stuck in the mud and must be pulled out. But lest we be so discouraged because of our sins, it is equally important to plead God as well for the removal of guilt from our consciences. 
You see, when true repentance has come upon us, we are bowed down in shame before God. And there is no relief till the Holy Spirit sprinkles our conscience afresh with the cleansing blood of Christ. The shame of having fallen. We need the Holy Spirit to remove the guilt from our consciences. Thus we hope that our souls shall be restored again to communion with God as He overrules our faults or failures for His glory and for our lasting good. Therefore, as God answers this prayer, this sincere petition, He will be careful to lead us from away from apostatizing. How, will, how far will God deliver us? Well, finally, God, God rescues us from evil by way of an ultimate deliverance. An ultimate deliverance. When He removes us from this fallen world and brings us home to heaven. In Matthew 25, verse 34, the Lord promised His disciples, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Notice the glory that awaits all true believers is the Lord's kingdom. And this is not an ordinary kingdom. It is the kingdom. It is the kingdom that infinitely surpasses all the kingdoms of the earth in glory, honor, wealth, power, and pleasure. And because this kingdom is the Father's kingdom, therefore into this glorious kingdom is a, solid, uh, is a solemn admittance of all true believers. That's why it says, Come, who are blessed of my Father. They are blessed. They, they are admitted into His kingdom as undoubted heirs. Who are these people? Believers. Their right to the kingdom is recognized and owned. Therefore, on that day, and in full view of angels, men and devils, they, these heirs, these believers in Christ Jesus, are invested with royalty and will solemnly be inaugurated before the whole world by the Lord Jesus Christ who is the heir of all things and who has all the power in heaven and in earth. So even when we pray, but deliver us from evil, we are reminded of this ultimate deliverance from this evil world. And this is probably the reason why a scribe somewhere down the line in the ancient church, a scribe tacked on a doxology which was not spoken by Jesus and is not found in the earliest and most reliable manuscripts of the New Testament. He said, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But for all the joys and glory of heaven, our greatest delight is the knowledge that that is where God is. Amen. For this prayer, remember our Lord taught us by saying at the start, Our Father who is in heaven. Charles Spurgeon wrote of this blessed anticipation. I quote, Oh, how sweet the prospect of the time when we shall not behold Him at a distance but see him face to face when we shall not be as a wayfaring man tiring but for a night, but shall eternally enfold us in the bosom of his glory. We shall not see him for a little season, but millions of years and myriads of angels of ages will adore the wonders of his love. In heaven there shall be no interruptions from care or sin, no weeping shall dim our eyes. Oh, if it be so sweet to see him now and then, 
How sweet to gaze on that blessed face forever and never have a cloud rolling between and never have to turn one's eyes away to look on a world of weariness and woe. If to die is to enter into uninterrupted communion with Jesus, then death is indeed gain and the black drop is swallowed up in a sea of victory. End of quote. Heaven, where our Lord dwells, and which is far removed from this present world, is therefore the sweet prospect we are reminded of when we pray, but deliver us from evil. Let's come before the Lord. Dear God and Father, we thank you that even as we see the world around us falling apart because of sin, even as we see the world getting darker each day, we thank you that we can be delivered from this present world. And we thank you, dear Lord, that even as we learn to pray, deliver us from evil, you assure us that we can be set free from sin. Thank you, dear God, for reminding this of this blessed fact. And we ask, Father, that those of us who are struggling with some sin might truly learn to pray this and that by your mercy we will see your delivering power even through your Holy Spirit. We pray also for those who have been put out of our church because of unrepented sin. Oh, we long for the day when they will come to a realization of their folly, a realization of the depth of their treachery, and that they will turn their hearts to you once again. We ask, dear God, that your Holy Spirit be with them even now, and that in your mercy, cause them to look back and, and remember the grace that you once showed them. We give you praise and thanks, dear Lord, for each and every one. And we ask, dear Lord, that you might just be with us uh, for the rest of the day and the rest of the week. We entrust each one into your loving care. In Jesus' name, amen. We have some announcements before we sing the final song. Uh, okay. Ang una po nating announcement ay Hindi Worship Song. Alright, All right. Let me get to see see the first one. Ano ba din nagyayon rito? Yung is it parenting? Okay, here. Parenting forum is back. Shepherding your children during a crisis. That's November 28, Saturday from 1:30 p.m. to about 3:30. Okay. Uh, some people have been asking about this in terms of uh, should it be will it be broadcast by a Zoom or anything? Um, yes, but I would encourage you to be here. Because that's a forum, and certainly I would like us to encourage one another. I will be teaching, but then I would like us also to be able to sharing to share with one another uh, in regard to uh, our issues about parenting our children in the face of a crisis. And but for those who cannot make it, like because I know there are mothers and uh, folks who cannot come, we even have some people abroad who. Who are asking that they be included here, so we are putting that uh, somewhere on a platform. I don't know if it's Zoom. Most likely, it's going to be Zoom. So don't forget, uh, November 28, 1:30 p.m. The second announcement is important. Uh, we ask for help for Katanduanes. Um, one of our, two of our brethren, are from or at least one of them is from there and she has a contact she has relatives there and she's asking for help and a church uh, a church actually was uh, had written us for help so what they're asking for are uh, let me see the, the next slide yes they're asking for that we donate clothes blankets and food items for all the victims of Typhoon Raleigh because most of the folks 
you know, they re- almost literally just escape with their clothes on their backs. Yun lang, yung suit nila, yun na po yun. Uh, so a local church contacted us uh, and we are asking for donations, clothes, food packs, uh, and blankets that could be helpful for them. Uh, and then they were, after Typhoon Raleigh, they were also hit by Ulysses. So, if you have uh, items to donate, please bring them every Sunday for the next three Sundays. We will be receiving them. But only on Sunday because we don't have place to store them. Brother Ariel Cortez uh, has committed to gathering the donations at the end of the afternoon service to bring them home. Okay? Tapos sila ang, uh, with these contacts the uh, Philippine Air Force, I think they're going to to ship that or fly that to Katanduane. So please uh, look into your closets, uh, the items that you probably have not worn for at least a year. Baka pwede nyo na pong ipamigay because it will help our countrymen there. It will And the church there too ha- practically has nothing. So uh, please donate. Ano pong mga items ang pwede nyo uh, uh, ibigay sa food? Wag po kayo magluto tapos ipadadala ninyo. Mapapanis po yun. Okay, yung mga noodles po, pwede po yan. Siguro, some canned goods, pwede po yan. So, bahala na po si Brother Ariel how to uh, pack them so that they can be shipped by the Philippine Air Force to Katantones. So, let's take part in that. Okay, let's all rise for our final song. Let's greet one another, brethren, before we sing. And let's remember that as we face this new week, let's continue to lean on God. We know that He is faithful. We know that we can be confident in Him.